Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our fourth of five talks about centrality. We've been looking at our sense of being a person or a me in the world. We've seen how the brain body, as I call it, gives us the ongoing story that we weave that explains our lives and our world to us and helps us navigate situations as they arise. And we've looked at the heart body, which is our relational core, that lets us feel into the quality of our relationships. In this session, we'll look at what I refer to as the earth body, how although the earth may seem separate from who we are, in a certain sense, it is so ever present that it actually forms a part of our sense of self. Let's begin. We've looked so far at how what I call the brain body and the heart body contribute to our sense of personhood. Let's review the brain body contribution. We move through our world explaining to ourselves our circumstances, our history, and considering our options for moving forward. We do this habitually as we encounter changing circumstances. And it amounts to a function that we could call storytelling. So we have this story we tell ourselves about our lives. In some sense, it's a very large story that dates all the way back to our childhood, covers everything that's happened to us, our community of origin, our education, our history of activities, both employment and recreational, the various ups and downs and traumas and medical conditions and joys, births, weddings, etc. So there's the long saga of a whole life that we hold in mind and sometimes rehearse. But there are also much shorter, more moment-by-moment -moment stories we tell ourselves as we evaluate situations. We walk into a store and we see that they don't have some product that we need at home and we come up with some reason why that might be the case and wonder is there another store that would have this product or should I find a substitute here? That too is a kind of storytelling, although we might also think of it as problem solving. But it amounts to the same thing. We're looking at a situation, forming a conceptual understanding and making a kind of prediction about where things are headed. This is really a very valuable function and it probably accounts for a lot of human success as a species. Of course, I think we all know that it can get us in trouble, especially if we get into the habit of telling ourselves negative and painful stories repeatedly or projecting negativity and pain onto circumstances that may not warrant it. Like I say, this capacity to make meaning with stories has served humanity well. One example of that is our ability to make and use tools. In order to use a tool, we have to have a sense of a kind of story in mind. So if I look at one of the drills here, I can imagine picking it up and attaching a bit and turning the handle and boring a hole into a block of wood. There's a sequence of steps there, and that amounts to a kind of narrative. Now, if I have used the tool many, many times, that narrative may not actually occur to me conceptually. It may just be a body memory at that point. But certainly during the phase of constructing a new tool or learning to use a tool that I've never used before, there will be this sense in which my mind will play through the sequence of steps involved in order to succeed and use the tool successfully. So tool making and tool using strongly leverages the brain body's story making capacity. Another value that comes out of the story making is 
our ability to orient ourselves in a linear sequence of time. So as long as there have been people, there have been changing seasons, perhaps more so as humans migrated toward polar regions, but there was always a sense of rainy seasons and dry seasons, cold seasons and warm seasons and so on. Now all animals have ways of working with the seasons and preparing for them. For instance, bears go into hibernation, squirrels uh, store up uh, excess food, and so on. But humans have this way of story forming around the passage of time and the progression of seasons and other aspects of environmental change. So in the middle of winter, humans could celebrate the winter solstice and the gradual arrival of spring and then summer and then fall again. This would provide them both with a sense of hope and also help them prepare and plan for changing circumstances over time. So this capacity to embed the current situation in a historical narrative, a historical story, has also served humanity very well. And again, this is one of those things that is a benefit but can also be uh, something of an impediment if we lock ourselves in to stories that are rigid, perhaps uh, not so adaptive to the current circumstances, etc. And I think we can imagine plenty of examples of that. So that's the contribution of the head body. It orients us to the world in ways that help us live more successfully on this planet we call Earth. And that's the point I want to make here, that these functions that I've been outlining in the last couple of talks, the storytelling function and the relational functions that we'll come to in a moment, are adaptive. They evolved, we presume, in early human uh, history or prehistory. They enabled the survival and thriving of our species and accounted for the fact that our ancestors were successful in leaving descendants and all the way up to the present day. And here we are benefiting from that human capacity for storytelling and other adaptive functions. So in the case of the head body, the adaptive quality is oriented toward telling stories around tool making and working with changing circumstances over time. If we focus now instead on the heart body, we come to that relational core that was mentioned in the last talk, our ability to sense intuitively and directly and in the soma, in the body, the quality of our relationships, particularly with other people, but also with animals and the natural world. And so there are feeling tones that arise in the body, agitated ones like fear and anger, depleted ones like sorrow and grief, and then hopefully plenty of times of more comfortable, contented ones of fullness, brightness, and joy. These give us a monitoring capacity to understand people in this deeply intuitive way, uh, very automatically, very swiftly as we interact with them in real time. And this too is adaptive and helps us survive on this planet Earth. Now clearly, in many senses, our most important relational activities center around other humans. And so this must have evolved to help us negotiate group living in, in, in evolutionary time. But we don't just relate with other humans. We also relate with other organisms and a whole web of life. And the relational core comes into play there as well. Again, emphasizing the point that this function of relational sensing is adaptive. It helped our ancestors in deep time survive, thrive, reproduce, and eventually lead to the human population that uh, covers the planet today. So that's a bit of a review. And it gives us a good handle uh, for a meditation. We begin by establishing ourselves in a comfortable posture. Feeling supported and maintaining alertness.
we draw attention to the movement of breath in the body. The rise and fall of the front of the chest wall. As air moves in and out. We can draw our attention back behind the chest wall into that sensitive area where we feel relational effects. When we feel warmly supported by another, there's a quality of fullness and contentment in the body core. And when we feel lonelier and more isolated, there can be a sense of heaviness or coldness or hollowness. For the moment, it doesn't matter too much exactly what we're feeling. The point here is to remember that no matter what we feel, it's our body doing its best to guide us in our relationships. Similarly, whatever thoughts may be playing across the mind, memories or plans, whether positive or dispirited, they too result from capacities that evolved to help us thrive on earth. So the whole field of human experience, thought and feeling, and bodily sensation and all the rest, has evolved to help us survive, to meet one another on occasion, to reproduce, raise families, also to guide new generations, to express ourselves, to produce works of art or works of benefit to humanity or to our families and friends. Whatever we do in life, comes out of this evolved capacity of the body to think and to feel and to find a way forward creatively and in service of life. Just meeting the vast expanse of experience moment by moment with perhaps a sense of gratitude for how long it took for this human capacity to evolve and how hard it works on our behalf. And we'll take a look now at the Last of the three components we're going to cover in this series, what I call the earth body. And this is the felt sense of being an earthly organism oriented toward a planet, its gravitational field, and spending our entire lives first developing in the womb on earth and then living through infancy, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood on Earth, and also having evolved on Earth, so that our entire body, both in terms of personal and evolutionary history, is oriented toward this earthly experience and has a deep and profound memory of and connection with the Earth as being a home for the organism. So we stand upon a planet much of the time, and we know 
in a moment-by-moment -moment sense which way is up and which way is down, which is to say we know where the earth lies beneath our feet. And this is so consistent and so important that I think of it as part of what I'm calling the earth body, this ongoing sense of being oriented on the planet, so much so that we could almost look at our awareness of the planet as being part of what I call the earth body, part of the body as a whole. As I practice in this way, I increasingly feel that my sense of the earth below is merely an extension of my sense of the rest of my body. And this is what I'm advocating as a way of grounding and stabilizing the organism, reminding it in an ongoing way of its connection to this planet that supports it. Now, each of us have these capacities, the brain body, the heart body, and the various functions of the earth body. And as I've suggested, they are all in service of connecting us with an ecosphere, with the other life forms on earth and the weather patterns and the geography of our home planet, our only planet. And in a certain sense, the brain and heart bodies are really part of this earth body function, of this connecting function of the organism with the earth. All organisms are strongly oriented toward the earth. A striking example is the migratory bird, in this case the Arctic tern, which travels from one pole to the other twice a year, racking up tens of thousands of miles of travel. Clearly, to make such long voyages, this bird has to have an internal sense of its position on the planet, a kind of internal compass, or in more modern terms, an internal GPS system. It's not just the tern, but all migratory birds that are able to navigate long distances because they can remain oriented to landmarks, uh, lines of magnetic force, polarized light. There are various ways in which organisms can orient to the earth, and migratory birds use many of them. Well, we also have systems for orienting toward the earth. An important one is in the middle ear which we can remove and look at in isolation. So the lower part of this structure to the left is the cochlea, responsible for detecting sound, but the upper part with the three semicircular uh, structures is an apparatus that detects our orientation relative to gravity and also changes in acceleration and movement. In effect, it acts as a kind of gyroscope allowing us to remain aware of which direction is up and which is down, even if the body is knocked off kilter a bit through movement and other changes. We always have a sense, perhaps not always consciously, but we always have an awareness of where the earth is in our experience, and part of that awareness comes from this inner ear uh, organ. It helps us move effectively upon the planet. Now the pelvic girdle illustrated here is really the center of our movement apparatus, particularly for walking and running and so on. It's at the base of the spine and it's also the articulation point for the lower limbs, the legs. And the information from the inner ear structures allows us to move using the pelvis as a base of movement in effective and coordinated ways upon the earth. And in a more ongoing and background sense, we also maintain that quality of knowing where the earth is relative to our body at all times. We have this continual sense of the planet beneath us. When people lose that sense, which doesn't happen very often, but can occur for, in particular, astronauts, the body suffers. So there must be something very thrilling about being an astronaut in a weightless environment, hovering uh, above the Earth, where up and down no longer have that felt sense that we experience when we're on the surface of the planet. 
but it is disorienting. The astronauts often experience nausea and what, it, what they call space sickness, at least for a time, and the bones and muscles deteriorate without the continual presence of the expected by gravitational field. Because the organism evolved in a particular gravity and developed in a particular gravity, it is tuned to expect and require that gravitational experience. And in the absence of it, there is a loss of muscle mass and bone strength, and there is a necessity for long periods of rehabilitation after extended uh, periods of time in, for instance, the International Space Station. What's happening here is that inner gyroscope no longer has a way of maintaining its reference. It's lost its tether, so to speak. And again, this is disorienting, not only for the human mind, but also for the human body. Well, there are many other structures besides the ones in the middle ear that orient us toward our planet. Even our skin is involved. It has sensors that detect changes in pressure and vibration. And this allows us, for instance, to feel the sensation of walking through the soles of our feet, through the skin that covers the soles of our feet. There are sensors in the muscles, joints, and tendons that give information about the relative position of the joints. And here, relative always tends to include a sense of relative to the earth. There are important neurologic structures in the brain and also in the spinal cord that maintain this quality of orientation to the planet. Structures such as the basal ganglia and the cerebellum in the brain. And then in the spinal cord, there are reflex circuitries that uh, we are familiar with from visits to uh, physicians where we get our uh, tendon below our knee tapped and the leg kicks out in a reflex, that reflex is also connected to this continual maintenance of some sense of orientation uh, relative to the planet orientation in space. By virtue of all of these systems, we are able to perform sophisticated movements on the surface of the Earth. Now, I doubt that very many people watching will be able to do this kind of sophisticated acrobatics, maintaining uh, an orientation toward the Earth while undergoing these complex movements. And we can think of many other examples of complex movement upon the surface of the Earth that uh, very skilled people can perform. But even if we're not skilled in that way, we perform the remarkable task of simply walking and moving across the face of the Earth. And that also requires this ongoing sense of orientation. So with all of these sensors and others, we do maintain an inner sense of the earth and our orientation relative to it. And this is such a consistent part of our experience that I consider it an extension of our body image. And I believe that it can be very wholesome and helpful to notice how connected we are to the earth in this ongoing continual sense of where the earth is located relative to the organism at all times. The sense that the earth, in fact, is part of the organism's experience every moment and therefore could be looked at as part of the organism itself, if we so choose. Well, we can add in our storytelling function and our relational sensing functions and add those to this orienting toward a particular planet with particular webs of life, particular human communities, and we're continually maintaining a kind of orientation toward them so that we can respond effectively in service of thriving upon the earth. And so there's this centrality to earthly orientation and earthly experience that forms part of the centrality that I've been trying to highlight in this series of talks. So yes, one aspect of centrality is simply the quality of being a person, but the other aspect is orienting that personhood to the earth that is ever-present beneath our bodies. And this also can be a nice meditation.
So we now have another component to add to the meditation that we did a little earlier. We can bring in the ever-present knowing of the earth relative to the body, the earth beneath us. Adopting in your comfortable posture, maintaining alertness, tuning into the movement of breath in the body, settling deeper into the body, noticing the changing feeling tones, subtly vibrating or shifting from moment to moment as feelings of pleasure and displeasure arise and pass. Notice the chatter of the mind with less concern about its precise contents, but noticing its eagerness to solve problems, to keep you oriented and safe. And feel how obvious it is that there is an earth beneath. How we take for granted, but can now tune in to the support of the ground below how the body has an ongoing awareness of where the earth is and how it is positioned relative to the earth's surface. This is a background and continual experience of human awareness. Can you see how the awareness of the earth is as continuous as awareness of your body, your legs, your torso, and so on. Can you imagine for the moment that the earth is in an important sense so continually present for your body that it is in essence a part of it, this quality of a planet below upon which all movement is based, across which all locomotion occurs. Feeling the space below your feet and below your body as an extension, as if there were tendrils or blood vessels that make you one with the earth which gave you birth. <laughs> 